back. Nice to have you with us here. So, we're going to talk aerospace. AI-driven uh, aerospace technologies are optimizing production processes, enabling predictive maintenance and facilitating quality control in this arena. So the way these are going to work for the next few in these industry conversations, I'm going to bring out a moderator. A moderator is going to spend the first part of the panel talking with an industry leader to get their perspective, and then the rest of the panelists will also join in the conversation. And then we're going to end it with either a researcher or a startup to give a bit of their perspective. So that's how the next few industry conversations are going to work, and we're going to start with aerospace. So let me introduce you to our panel. Our industry leader is Executive Vice President of Manufacturing, IT, and Bombardier, Bombardier Operational Excellence System, David Murray. David's going to come on out here. Joined by the Managing Director of Enterprise Data and Artificial Intelligence at Air Canada, Bruce Stamm. Come on out here, Bruce. The Vice President of Global Products Engineering, CAE, Philippe Couillard, is going to be here. Senior Director of Aftermarket Products, Digital Pricing for Bombardier, Elsa Brunel Young, the Executive Director of Customer Service Programs at Pratt and Whitney Canada is Nivin Kalab, and our Researcher, Lecturer, and Academic Programs Coordinator at McGill University is John Graddock. And moderating this entire panel is the President and CEO of Aero Montreal, Melanie Lucier. Welcome, oh hi Melanie, welcome, come on up. I'll leave it with you, let's welcome them to the stage. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, it is Dave. I'm sorry. So it's such a pleasure for me. C'est un plan, grand, grand plaisir d'être uh, ici aujourd'hui avec vous, avec vous, mes amis de l'industrie, avec vous, c'est les participants pour vous parler d'un sujet qui me tient à cœur personnellement depuis plus de 25 ans. Donc uh, la collision entre uh, l'aérospatiale et l'IA. Donc, uh, before we start, David, we're going to be uh, uh, chatting for about 15 minutes. Uh, please allow me just a bit of context for the people that are in the room about the aerospace industry in Quebec. So you have to know that we have 250 companies that are very active in aerospace uh, in the province only. So 98% of these companies are concentrated in the Montreal area as AI is. And we have, we represent as an industry 18 billion in revenues just for the province of Quebec. And 38,000 uh, workers are working in the aerospace industry. And in Montreal, it's the highest rate per capita of uh, aerospace worker in the world. So we're one worker out of 67 is working in the aerospace. So you always have to be careful uh, who you talk to because it's probably your brother-in-law or uh, cousins of somebody uh, that you're talking to. And we have to uh, be very proud of the fact that we're one of the few na nations that can develop manufacture and certify an aircraft. So that is a very distinctive uh, uh, thing about our region. Um, and with, uh, with regards to AI, it, the AI has revolutionized the, uh, the, um, the aerospace in terms of efficiency and productivity, of course. But over the years, we also uh, uh, begin to be better at utilizing, uh, analyzing large amount of data coming from the aircraft systems. So they can detect, uh, so we can detect anomalies predict failures and trigger maintenance actions before problem, problems occur. And as a passenger, we're all for it, right? So we're very, very happy that AI can help you doing, uh, can help us doing that. So predictive maintenance is one of the application, field of application of AI in aerospace. Of course, uh, quality control would be another one. So we have an AI machine vision system that can now detect the anomalies before they go in the supply chain and before they are installed on a final product. So that's uh, one of the areas of collaboration that AI uh, and aerospace has uh, demonstrated in the last few years. So, David, on va commencer avec toi by your conversation. Thank you very much for being here again. Um, so I'm giving, I just gave a couple of examples, but there's nothing like uh, hearing it from the um, horse's mouth. Um, so what do you think about the edge uh, that Mont Montreal has of having both AI and aerospace? How, what does it bring to your company, Bombardier, and to the whole in aerospace industry to have uh, such two great uh, um, products and uh, knowledge in the same area so merci melanie thank you uh it's a real pleasure for uh, for me to be here so bombardier um, 
has been uh, making uh, many transformations. So first thing uh, that we've done is we refocus ourselves, which have been uh, paying off. So we see uh, the performance of the company over the last three years. It's been doing you know really really good. Uh, but we can't stop it there. So obviously you know we're we're one of the few uh, manufacturers of uh, global uh, business jets, and business jets you know are, are key in in the world today. Um, more transformations are coming. So number one, actually, we're working into a lean transformation, which is active. Second thing is we're doing a major transformation on all the IT infrastructure, which is actually the segue, the perfect segue for us to benefit from you know, digital transformation AI, which is you know, the perfect place to be when you think about you know, all the um, talent that we have in Montreal. Uh, we, you know, we have multiple universities. It's, it's, it's an, a golden opportunity for us, you know, to take this expertise and bring us to the next level. And we're working really, really actively. So you'll hear from Elsa and our team later on on AI and what we've been doing. So a uh, few incredible projects, and we have more, uh, more in the pipeline coming. So, and how, how do you manage this transformation within your company? So, do you treat the, the, the data, do you manage the data, data differently, the way it shapes maybe your, your business model in some of the area, let's say the aftermarket uh, uh, business model, does it change? So, how do you do it concretely? So, actually, we wanted to learn. So, the first thing we've done is we set up like an innovation council, uh, because from different, you know, uh, groups in the organization, either engineering, supply chain, IT operations, we want to have something that's, you know, uh, where our employees are going to be working together, where we're going to invest $1 is going to be where we're going to get the biggest return on investment. Mm. So that was, that was the first step. The second step is we decided to go uh, and see. Go and see the best of the best in the world. So we, uh, we uh, looked out at the few uh, people helping out, and we decided to visit, you know, different companies. We visited roughly 10 companies around the world to see uh, how they've done it, uh, what are the, the traps we have to be careful and, and you know, how we should attack the, uh, the transformation, of which, you know, very simply put, is think small, make you know, a good uh, example, and then you know, the culture and the shift is going to happen in the organization, of which is going to make you know, the organization will, uh, uh, get its full, uh, its full potential. And like this kind of transformation and this kind of, of changes that you're bringing to your company, like we're talking about a profound transformation. So how are you supporting the teams, like the workers and the different teams that are working with different skill sets right now? And how do you integrate that? Yeah, so anyone that's been dealing with this know that, you know, attracting people is really, really difficult. So it's, uh, and we're only at the beginning of AI in aerospace. So I imagine, you know, in five, 10 years from now, it's just mm. going to be complete madness. And, and, you know, AI is unleashing new possibilities that we're, we're not thinking of. So once this wheel is going to go, it's going to go crazy. So what we've been doing, uh, first, first thing uh, uh, that's important in, uh, to keep in mind is to use uh, the students from university. So Bombardier is hiring roughly 1,000 students every year, which is, uh, we're one of the, the employers that's hiring the most in terms of students. And this is, this is quite amazing. We've organized what we call a digital den, so mm. like the dragons. Yeah. And it's great to see because we had people you know, from different universities getting up together. You had people from you know, finance, you had you know, data scientists, you had uh, engineers getting together. And we, we, we selected actually uh, students that were there before, so second year, third year or more in terms of, of being a, an intern into the company. And then we asked them to come and present, you know, projects to us. So we were uh, the senior leadership team was, you know, like the judges. Mm -hmm. And we had these teams preparing, you know, for a couple of weeks and then they made the presentation. So it took, you know, all day. And we were actually, you know, flabbergasted with, with the solution that came in, you know, some, some stuff that we wouldn't think. Because typically, you know, you've been doing your operations like, you know, for a certain way for many, many years. And you got these new young generation coming. Mm -hmm no blockage, no limit, and proposing, and you know, you should do this and this, and then you're like, wow. So that's, that's one way for us, you know, to, to capture the talent at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and they've, they've lived the industry and the, 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 the enterprise from the inside, which is, which is absolutely great. And they're coming with a different, completely different mindset and no, uh, like, ideas how it should work. So they're completely open to uh, find new ways of doing uh, what we've been doing for the same way for several years, right? Yeah, because typically, you know, an organization, uh, you know, will want to replicate as we're going to an IT mm. uh, transformation right now. 
uh, the leaders will want to replicate what they have. Just, just, just give me what I had, you know, and, and <coughs> keep, keep producing and keep doing, which, you know, is a chance in a chance of a lifetime, right? And the debate, you know, we're, we're having, it's exciting uh, opportunity for us is we've developed these, you know, probably a couple of years ago where the technology was X. So if I'm copying that technology, you know, we can't live with that new technology for the next 30 years, so we got to set the boundaries in order to achieve that, right? We don't want to replicate, replicate the uh, Atari 2600 for the next 2500, uh, for the next 25 years, right? So it's, 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 it's important that we, we leverage that. And AI is certainly something that, you know, will push, uh, will push the limit. And data is so, so, you know, getting the right people is going to be key. Second is, you know, aligning the data. So this is, this mm. is the fuel to make that transformation. So we got to you know, uh, align that data. We've hired a team to look at data management. Uh, you know, compliance is going to become more and more important. Uh, the quality, the integrity of the data. Mm -hmm. So whenever we're building all these algorithms, as we're building them, you'll see a pure example uh, later on with Elsa, uh, that it really works and it gets you know, a return investment that's, re that's really quick. And what are the, uh, the main uh, issues that we're, you're finding with data as it is right now? Well, f the data is there. Um, so most companies, I mean, you, you have the Encyclopédie Britannica of data, right? It's really, it's really to put the focus on the right data and not, not focus and tackle everything at the same time. Uh, build a team, so a master data team, so that will control and, and structure the data in such a way when, when we have the uh, data scientists uh, and mathematicians coming and creating you know, the algorithms that they have the tool and, mm -hmm. and, and the fuel to do these algorithms as fast as possible, because the name of the game is, is speed. Uh, and for us, you know, it's not a question of if we're going to do it, it's when we're going to do it. So yeah. now it's just about speed. So Bombardier is really betting on their future with, with this transformation uh, through, through AI. Uh, and it will certainly require new skills uh, that you never had before uh, in, a, in a, an industry that's largely based on engineering and really following the regulation, which is great. Again, when we're taking aircrafts, we want to make sure that our products are safe. safe. So we often say at Air Montreal that we're going to need the replacement of the 38,000 skilled worker in the next 10 years. So it's going to be a complete shift. So how uh, and what kind of profile actually will Will you be looking at in the future for the skill sets, uh, profile of, of new employees that were different from what we, uh, we used to see in the, uh, in the industry? Yeah, well, we're, we're going to go with the basics. Obviously, there's, there's some fundamentals in, in building an airplane, uh, you know, which are all the basic skills, manual skills that, that uh, is existing today, of which you know, we could incorporate uh, robotics. Obviously, we started in, the, in our Toronto facility uh, to incorporate uh, robotics. So, New skill sets in robotics is certainly mm -hmm. going to be a, 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 something important. Going back to you know uh, basic uh, uh, upholsters and stuff like that is going to be also critical. Well, you know, data scientists, like I said earlier, mathematician is going to be key. IT people, uh, you know, to connect all this. So we have a big umbrella. Uh, so people, as they're developing, you know, these these new uh, possibilities, they connect, and we really unleash the full potential of data. Yeah, and we discussed it, uh, uh, and that's going to be my, my last question for you, uh, uh, David, before I know you have to run, so before you, you, you have to go. But we talked about how can we make ourselves more attractive as an industry to these new talents, because we said it, we're very traditional, we're perceived as like a, a very high um, barriers to entry, let's say for somebody that develops like maybe an algorithm or an, uh, an application or so. How are we going to be able that, to attract these new talents to consider the aerospace for their products? Yeah, I think as big organization, we have a responsibility um, to work with the startups mm. uh, locally, to work with the universities. Um, that's, that's, in my mind, you know, uh, super key. Uh, sometimes uh, the organization, you know, big organization, they're all working in silos. Yeah. So I think we could, you know, there's some, some organization are not necessarily competing once, once uh, against another. So, so, you know, teaming up with, with, you know, local companies so we can, you know, there's uh, attack and trigger uh, activities that will benefit everybody and then link up, you know, with, with the university. Like I said, you know, the digital mm. then that we've done, I mean, you know, just on social media, it was like exploding, you know, yeah. all the pride that all the, the, the students have done. 
And for us, it's a good way to retain uh, the people after that, right? So it's so doing the same thing, but differently, right? right. So, so make sure that the approach is adjusted to the uh, the, the, the workers and the, yep. the skills and the talent that we want to attract. So do you want? Do you have a last word before you you go about like Bombardier's implication and uh, the links that they have with uh, that you have with uh, AI? Well, I can say that uh, you know Bombardier has been going uh, uh, through a lot of transformation, but uh, it is super exciting, you know, for us in Bombardier and in, in, in making that transformation. And uh, AI is just, you know, bringing new possibilities from a design perspective, from a customer mm -hmm. perspective. Uh, you'll hear about the supply chain perspective, aftermarket uh, perspective. So, you know, thinking about, you know, having the information beforehand, you know, from, from before the customer knows what's going on. So it's just, uh, it's just great. And even goes right now, you know, uh, different projects that we have, even in HR, you know, yeah. tracking, being better and faster in hiring because now it's a talent war. So uh, if you're faster, you're going to scoop uh, the, best, the best people before. So uh, it's a really exciting time for us. And we have to say, like, just the products by itself, like whether it's been uh, uh, just taking a plane with Air Canada or uh, uh, using a simulator, flight simulator that simulates, like, uh, the, the, the products themselves, the aircraft is a, is a, is a nice product. We, don't, we always say we don't sell potatoes, right? So it's, it's just the, the industry is exciting by itself. Yeah. Uh, it's actually bringing it to a different level. So, when, yeah. you know, we're developing an EcoJet now. Yeah. And uh, there's no pilot in that plane. Right, That's so crazy. when you think about it, right, so it's kind of kind of incredible. So imagine all the uh, intelligence that's behind this, you know, flying. Yeah. An uh, aircraft. So it's uh, it's really exciting times. Yeah, yeah, and the advanced air mobility where you're gonna have like big drones carrying uh, either people or, or or goods. So thank you very much, David. I know you have to run yep. because it's the end of the quarter for Bombardier. So good luck with that. And I'm gonna turn over to my uh, colleagues for the uh, the panel section of uh, of this uh, uh, um, intervention. So. Um, so the first question I will have for you guys and to break the eyes is, can you share with us a concrete project? <laughs> so we talked about like we, we're trying to have people dreaming about joining the aerospace uh, industry. So I will, I will start with, uh, with you, Bruce, at Air Canada, if you want to describe one of the projects that you did in AI and what was the, I would say, the, the motivation to go towards uh, AI? No, I don't think it works. Hello? Yeah. Okay, there we go. So I'll, I'll start with, a, with an easy one, and I'll, maybe I'll set the stage with a bit of context. So we started our AI program in 2018, so we're in year five. It's a team of roughly 30 permanent employees at Air Canada, and we supplement that with some Quebec-based companies uh, for additional horsepower in what we're doing. So we're delivering probably three or four, we're working on three or four projects per year, anything from revenue management, cargo, but the one I want to touch on probably Im Im impacts where people will be delighted most about this one is how do we improve on-time performance? <laughs> so in past, and, and, and we've done network planning for how do we build an air, air, aircraft uh, schedule. It's 270 aircraft flying per day. We're building schedules over the next 18 months. Up to now, that has been done largely sort of Excel uh, Microsoft PowerPoint, it's very low tech. So what we've done, and it's based on ideal conditions. So what we put together a team to look at historical um, t time to leave, time to land, four or five different KPIs, and uh, paired that with simulation. So what we're able to give our network planning team is a whole bunch of what-if scenarios that they can run different schedules and understand what are the uh, stress points in a schedule and make the certain adjustments. So that's something that we're going to go live in the next couple of months. It's a team of 30, but some of the challenges we've had with that is there are literally 60 things that determine whether your plane leaves on time. Half of the airline controls, the rest are external factors, anything from air traffic control to getting through security on time. So the, the uh, I guess the <laughs> data science work and the heavy lifting and understanding the problem and tuning the model to get accuracy prediction has been both a challenge, but has, you know, to what we talked about with David, has been a, a real uh, thing to attract uh, the people and inspire the team mm -hmm. that they're helping contribute to probably what our biggest point, pain point of an airline is these days is getting you to where you want to go on time as advertised. 
Yeah, so because this is this is the customer facing experience, that's it. right? So this is the first thing that your customer will uh, remember, even if the flight is super smooth after and you you recuperate, like they're gonna remember if their flight was uh, was late. That's and, it. And yeah. In the end, nobody cares whether the coffee was good yeah, or not. Yeah. It's if they the got there on time. Work. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Philip, uh, let's talk a bit about the CAE because I'm I'm super proud always. Like people know like Bombardier and the Pratt and Whitney's and the the Airbus that are in the in, in Quebec, but CAE, we have to, I'm going to do the info pub, sorry, but we have to say, and people have to realize that you're the number one uh, flight simulation company in the world. So you're leading the way and showing the way in terms of uh, flight simulation. Uh, uh, so very proud to have you on that panel. And can you describe one of the, 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 the projects that you did uh, at CAE uh, in terms of AI? Well, thank you, and, and, and it's nice of you to invite invited me here today. Um, so yes, we make flight simulators, but see, we identify ourselves as a training company. Yeah. We train pilots. It just so happens that the simulators are the way in which we provide that training. Now, we have over a thousand simulators in service across the world, across multiple types of aircraft, and every few milliseconds, they'll output the status of the simulator as the pilot is training. Now. Analyzing that provides us but a window into the total behavior of the pilot. We can assess its, uh, the abilities of the pilot to fly. However, when you combine that with biometrics and the way to assess cognitive and adaptive state, we can get a much better picture of the ability of the pilot to do his or her job. Right? And AI is instrumental into that. Now, we have a program called CE Rise. It's in, in service right now, and this is what it does. It sucks all that information from the behavior of the pilot, the cognitive load, the biometrics, whether it's eyes, where they focus on the mm -hmm. dashboard. Combine that with the uh, ability, the behavior, and the response of the sim, and we get a much better assessment of how he or she is doing. And this opens up the way into what we call competency-based training, which is not only looking at the abilities to fly, but also how the pilot is behaving. And this is w the way the industry is going, and this is something that we are at the forefront of, and AI is instrumental in, in, in doing that. Were it not for our access to that, we would not be able to do what RISE does. Yeah, yeah, and the, the more you train the pilot before they, they actually are on an airplane, the safer the, right. the, 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 the flight gets. And yes, absolutely. Like, I mean, the more you understand the behavior as well. Right. Obviously, pilots must be trained the first time they slid into the cockpit, and often the first time you will fly, um, the pilot will the first time he's in the actual cockpit because he's trained all of his uh, mm -hmm. before on the sims. But... It's a regulated industry, so the pilot must go every few months, go and show that he or she is proficient at doing what they do. So, again, this further allows us to not only look at entire fleet of aircraft, entire cohorts of pilots, but sometimes working on specific pilot's abilities mm -hmm. and see how she or he uh, gets better at doing uh, at doing, doing yeah because they train job. so much and you can monitor their reaction like even they're not aware some of the reactions they're not going to be aware of you're looking too long at this screen obviously or yeah and, and this is something that the instructor who's always sitting in the back can give uh, as the debrief after the training session uh, the instructor can because AI does a lot of the work of analyzing some of the responses and the abilities the uh, instructor can focus on things that are more general, but nevertheless critical. How the pilots communicate with one another, because there's always two of them in the pilot. How do they handle, you know, tasks and assignments? So this is, this is key. A, were it not for AI, we would not be able to train better pilots and better train them. Yes. That's reassuring, for sure. <laughs> Elsa, so. you, you work at Bombardier as well, and uh, David alluded to the project that you want to talk about uh, today. So describe, like, because he, he talked about the transformation, but you're actually the two hands into the, 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 the project. So can you tell us a bit more about one of the uh, specific projects you have in AI at Bombardier? 
Sure. Well, at Bombardier, being the largest business aircraft manufacturer uh, in the world, innovation is really at the center of our DNA. So we're always looking for new ways to be more efficient to solve complex problems. And we support a fleet of over 5,000 business jets worldwide in our aftermarket, and that's the organization which I'm part of. Um, and so in that context, we started on our AI journey about three years ago in the aftermarket. And we started with small projects, lower risk, proof of concepts to get familiar and also to see the value. And from there, we were able to grow our capabilities. So I'll give you two examples, maybe a more simple one and then a larger one. One of the first AI applications we started at Bombardier is an inventory forecasting model using AI. And the goal was to better predict what aircraft parts we would need in our inventory because you want to have the right part at the right time. Also, aircraft parts are quite costly, so it's important you to not build overstock. Stocks. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so we used AI to develop a model um, which was actually forward-looking in our predictions, and this was uh, allowing us to go from a historical-based model to really this forward-looking AI, um, AI-based one. And the results were that we were actually able to get benefits that surpass the objectives of our, of our project. So that was a smaller case we started with, and now we're doing a much larger endeavor with predictive maintenance. So this is an entire program, really, where the goal is to build AI capabilities to predict when an aircraft part would need to be repaired or replaced before it actually happens. And this is answering a really important customer need, which is to proactively maintain their aircraft and the complex systems of their aircraft so that their aircraft is available when they want it and it has the highest levels of reliability. And right now, we have access to thousands of parameters from the aircraft, and we're able to provide our customers with a health management program and help them troubleshoot. However, when you're looking to do uh, predictions into the future, that's where no human can really do that job, and that's where AI comes in. Mm. So we've developed the predictive maintenance program with three different steps. The first one is anomaly detection. So we've got all these parameters, but we need to figure out with AI what's a normal range and what's abnormal. Once you have something that seems to be abnormal, the second phase is the diagnostics, finding what is the most probable root cause. And finally, the third one is the fun stuff, the prognostics, which is predicting when you're going to need to do a maintenance event so that you can do it ahead of time. And I have to say, we're not doing this only with AI. We're actually combining engineering expertise, physics-based models together with the AI so that we're, we're uh, teaching the AI on the right basis. And so these cutting edge capabilities are going to allow our customers to really improve their operations. Because unlike airlines like Air Canada, our customers don't have hundreds of aircraft. Sometimes our customers have one aircraft. But with this program, we aim to really give recommendations to them, even if they have that one aircraft, based on the insights from the entire fleet. Mm -hmm. And so this is allowing us to really reinforce our position uh, as the leaders in the industry with the most innovative and reliable jets in the world. Absolutely. It is a complete shift of seeing how maintenance can be done. because. As we speak right now, you're talking about cycles. If you do, let's say, a couple of cycles of you have to change that part or you have to do that maintenance. So now to be able to be at the part level saying, watch out because of the behavior of or the routes that you took, or da -da -da, this is the, that, that part might be uh, to change early, earlier. And then while the aircraft is sitting on the uh, tarmac, they can do it instead of uh, having it grounded after the fact. So very, very impressive and very like a, a big shift into how we, uh, we approach the, uh, the maintenance. It's of a the shift to being proactive. Yeah, exactly. Reactive. Just, yeah, yep. exactly. OK, and last but not least, uh, Nivin at Pratt & Whitney Canada, which is an uh, um, engine manufacturer, uh, part of the UTC group. Like, what, what do you do in AI and what, what are the projects that you're working on? Yeah, merci, uh, Melanie. First, uh, I just want to give a shout out to the Pratt uh, people sitting in the front row. They're actually <laughs> the ones doing the heavy lifting on the uh, AI projects that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, maybe just fundamentally, you know, the uh, engine manufacturers, we live in, you know, 2035. What you see 
uh, you know, flying now is because we've been on it for 20 years. And, you know, it was critical for us that if, when we look forward, it's almost impossible to imagine a future where either our products, uh, the way we manufacture them or the way we service them wasn't going to be somehow AI powered. So we, the idea was to embark on a journey where we not only did one use case, but were able to scale to a thousand use cases across the company and learn to flex that muscle. So we orchestrated a program that would help us build this uh, capability and the foundational element, including the technology stack, the talent, the strategy, um, that would get us to being autonomous on this capability. And I have to thank also Scale AI for being a partner into this uh, with us. So we identified a few uh, labs. This journey started about three years ago. Uh, similar to what Elza was, uh, was talking about, a good place to start uh, is in the aftermarket business. So for us, uh, you know, we have a very big retail business. Mm -hmm. It's uh, you know not commonly known, but we do have a big B two C uh, business where we have to get the right parts at the right time in the right place, and it starts with being able to get the right demand, and that is a prediction challenge. Uh, and you don't want to really overdrive the supply chain, especially in the current context today where we're, you mm. know, strained. Uh, so we started with uh, our aftermarket uh, spare parts business. And um, uh, from there, uh, obviously, we demonstrated that uh, the AI can provide a better accuracy in the forecasting. And uh, we also tagged on a few other use cases uh, for example, to be more specific, when an engine comes in the shop, uh, there's a, a detailed inspector that will determine if uh, this part goes for a repair, if it's replaced with new, if it's uh, uh, you know exchanged, and uh, you know this decision for that inspector. There's about 17 decisions per part, uh, 70,000 decisions a day, three million decisions that's adding a mental burden and is not always the most optimal uh, decision. So using AI, uh, we're able to uh, provide recommendations to the detailed inspector on what's the most optimal uh, path forward. Um, and you know the journey continues on more of the prediction of the life cycle cost of our products mm -hmm. um, and uh, how this is baked into providing a better value proposition in the end for the customers. Thank you very much, Evan. But l now we're going to switch to the issues because it's all good, and then we all describe a very good project. I'm pretty sure that you encounter the first time you do an AI project, the first uh, uh, steps. Yeah, somebody mentioned you have to take baby steps, but I'm pretty sure that in your respective areas, like there are some challenges on how you integrate the existing team with the new type of skills and and so uh, and even maybe we'll start with you and and do our way back from <laughs> to here uh, what 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 are the, uh, the the main challenges in implementing uh, uh, AI applications uh, at Pratt yeah I think we have to recognize first that implementing AI is quite a transformative uh, project mm -hmm. uh, you know we, we're not a startup we have 95 years of innovation going on another hundred hopefully and implementing in a brownfield requires uh, a lot of changes to how we how we work. You know, we're traditionally a waterfall type of uh, project organization, moving to agile. Um, I'll let the others also talk about some of the other challenges on the talent, for example. Uh, but I can tell you, you know, ha having done a few AI projects with the team, um, you know. I would say maybe 20% of it is spent on the actual Python code. 30% of it is spent on the data, where it's coming from, who owns it, how it's, you know, everything related to that. And 50% on the change management. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, we talk a lot about the skills and the data scientists, and, but change management skills is maybe not as sexy, but probably the most critical uh, skill. Very important, in, yes. yeah. How you manage that, that change, how you get it accepted, 
uh, and make sure to make sure that your project uh, goes well. So, uh, Philip, you want to you you want to go with the uh, and then we'll come back to Elsa then. Well, you know, I promised I would not say what she said. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, but but she's right, and those are internal challenges, and we face the same things in terms yeah. of adaptation and change management. But yeah. one of the 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 things that is interesting for all of us is we operate in a regulated industry, yeah. right? It, it, there are regulations and you can't put a jet into service, nor the engines, unless it's gone through a number of steps. Yeah. Same with training. Training is regulated. It must be done on certain types of devices. Um, as certainly our experience, as we're using AI more and more, we're also, uh, in some cases, ahead of industry or the regulator, mm -hmm. right? That you know, we're talking about governments, so, you know, You have sometimes to convince the regulators that it's going to be as good or better than... Exactly, because, the, you know, it's the safety of the public yeah. that's at stake, and, and that's the most important thing. Absolutely. So as we're looking at adding AI to our training curriculum and showing that we depend on it to assess the quality of the training and enhance the quality of the pilots, that's a challenge that we face. That has nothing to do with technology. It has to do with, okay... How comfortable are we mm. saying AI is here a discriminator that not only makes better pilots, better training, but also makes the training and the pilots just as safe as they were without the AI, yeah, right? Because you're replacing a human element, or it's not really replacing, it's supplementing yeah. through AI. And that's a challenge it's that bringing, has nothing yeah. to do with the tech. Understood. And Elsa, maybe uh, what, what did you encounter in your uh, deployment of the projects that was challenging? For our predictive maintenance project, I would say one of our initial and very large challenges was the data acquisition. So aircraft, in case you're not aware, actually generate thousands of parameters like temperature, pressure, things like that. But all that data is actually stuck on the aircraft and you would need a human being to go and retrieve it. So that's not really practical to go and do um, further analyses. So we developed a health monitoring device, kind of like a smartwatch, but for the aircraft. And we're providing this to all our customers. And these boxes have Wi-Fi and cellular capabilities. So the aircraft can then transmit the data back to the Bombardier data platform. And we can also, at the same time, offer a health monitoring service to our customers. Good, excellent. And uh, last but not least, uh, Bruce yeah, I mean, Air Canada. Again, similar, but I'll maybe touch on a couple of other things that we've seen and, and, and are, are still a challenge with. And I, it's under the category explainability. A lot of what we're doing is not only machine learning, but uh, combine that with simulation. So we're producing an output that used to be done by somebody who's been doing that job for 10 to 15 years. So we, mm -hmm. we've encountered a lot of the well, why should I trust that number? Because I know my numbers because it's on my spreadsheet that I've been doing the same job for 15 this, this years. The spreadsheet that I built over That's the it. years so that I control. It's part change management, yeah. but it's part of almost building into our process that we need to make sure we're taking our business users along the way in describing how we're getting those numbers such that they're comfortable in letting go and having the, the, the solution provide them a, a prediction that before they were doing. Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it takes a bit more effort mm -hmm. to uh, help sell what we've built, uh, well, help them, not replace them. Yeah, since we're a bit of uh, ahead of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a question there and everyone, anyone that wants to take it. How do you manage, and we alluded uh, to it with, with Dave, how do you manage these new uh, uh, projects with the existing team and how do you build the uh, skill sets of your existing employee and current employee with these new technologies and new ways of doing, uh, uh, David was mentioning like doing a, a den, like a, a digital den, and so it's breaking the, 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 the traditional way of doing things. So any topics or any, uh, Philip, I'm, I'm looking at you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, within my teams, I have around 1,500 engineers here in Montreal and, and in other parts of the world. Um, the, the people that are conversant in AI, that know what it can do about L, large language models or these other things, is relatively few. I mean, you probably cut them from mm. fingers of two hands. Now, this is fine because we're still certainly with us in the infancy, but as we're looking to um, leverage it more and more in the day-to-day -day and really 
use the full power of 1,500 engineers that, and software developers that, that know about it, that's the challenge. So we're looking at either upskilling and doing training, which mm. is one thing, uh, but also what would be more interesting to me is, and to, certainly to CAE, is, is getting some of the, as people come out of school, yeah. they're already conversant yeah. in some of the topics. They don't need to be experts, they just need to know about it mm -hmm. so that they can then, you know, once they have the basics, they learn how we do things at CE, and then I trust their smarts and their expertise and their drive to sort of say, here are areas where we could start using it in my day-to-day -day job and become yeah. better at it. So yeah. it's a combination of upskilling, which can be time-consuming and expensive, but also getting newer people coming out of school mm -hmm. that have those knowledge already, the same way they used to learn how to program C or, or C++ yeah. for those of you that are in my age bracket. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, Vin, do you want to add something on the uh, skills and on the well, uh, You know, yes, Philip and I were, were talking about that. It, that it's not a, a, you know, a fluid dynamic engineer or a data scientist. It's an end. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be an or. And for us to achieve scale, it has to be an end. But it's not just that. You know, around an AI project, there's product ownership. There's, uh, you know, business translators. There's mm. uh, scrum masters. There's a multitude of role that together make the success of uh, a, uh, an AI project. For us, we've got the center of excellence, which mostly defines the strategy, but it's a hub and spoke. So with... Sorry. <laughs> All my fault. <laughs> yeah, this is the... Uh <laughs> no, so with, within the, you know, the enterprise, uh, it's not one area that develops for the rest of the business units. It's spread out in the business units. Uh, with a center of excellence that helps with best practices, helps with yeah. uh, running the projects. That that's key. Okay, so we are. Yeah, they cut my mic because they they, they looked at I I cannot behave well <laughs> with that in my face. So the last question, I think we're gonna go like quickly uh, one minute per, maybe per uh, per person. So. If you pull out your crystal ball and look at the future, what do you think, um, where do you think the AI and aerospace will, uh, will lead um, to us in the next few years? Like, where are we aiming uh, in terms of uh, the, this integration? So maybe, uh, Bruce, you want to yeah, start? Yeah, I mean, yeah. We're, we're, I'm sure everybody is in here. We're tremendously excited about the opportunities with Gen, and a Gen AI and large language models. Yeah. I mean, we're doing our due diligence in terms of making sure that there's governance, there's explainability, but the opportunities in terms of bring people up to speed. I mean, Air Canada, during the pandemic, we went from 37,000 people down to 12, and then we've ramped up again. So the ability to people to tap into knowledge at their fingertips and understand the myriad of procedures and processes, you know, I almost wish we would have had that a couple of years ago as we were yeah. coming out of the pandemic. But we're, we're excited about that, but cautious and making sure we're not getting ahead of ourselves. Elsa. What about you? What do you see in the future of AI and aerospace? Yeah, I think there are many applications, both in the short and long term, that could benefit the, the industry. For example, um, recommendations that are specific to the individual from a sales mm. perspective, for example. Um, you can think about many processes which we've had you know, for 30 years in our industry that could be revolutionized with AI. And who knows, even the aircraft of the future could benefit mm -hmm. from some form of AI, I think. So for us at Bombardier, it's a really exciting time as we're developing a lot of these new capabilities. Yeah, pilotless uh, aircraft, it's going to need like a, ver a very good connectivity and, uh, and a lot of data for sure. Mm -hmm. Nivin? Uh, you know, I think it's going to be when the product and the business model are both uh, AI powered and, you know, they, they come together to provide uh, a different service or a different uh, type of uh, product to our customers that will unlock the true value of uh, AI in the aerospace. Good, thank you. And Philip, you have the, uh, the, uh, the hand. I think you mentioned it earlier uh, with David about advanced air mobility. Yeah. I think for us, uh, it's certainly an area where I, I see the most enthusiasm for. So picture a digital twin of a city along pilots to train in a fully immersive environment, but not only that, using AI to supplement the operations of it, of those devices, planning, you know, 
power consumption wins and basically integrate the training and the operations to one because it's yeah. the same data used you know, in different ways. That's where I see AI sort of in our case and where the industry is going. In yeah, to when we're going to have like drones again, like flying everywhere, how are we going to recharge them because they're mostly yeah, going to be uh, electrical, hopefully. And, and social then acceptability. Yeah, yeah, people exactly. want to see these things and the noise absolutely. that they make and, and all of that. So yeah, absolutely. This is important. Thank you so much to the four of you for being with, uh, with us today, with me today, and for exchanging uh, your views on, on how our two industry will uh, collaborate and increase the productivity and the safety of our products. So thank you very much. And don't go anywhere because our last speaker will be John, who's going to be doing the wrap up for the last 10 minutes of the, uh, the present. So, John, uh, up to you. You're a professor at McGill, so I'm uh, very curious to hear what you have to say about the way R2 industry will join. Thank you very much. Um, uh, before I start, a shout out to any, Mag any McGill grads in the room? <laughs> <laughs> a few? Okay, great. Um, so, what you know, AI means in aerospace is really a function of changing fundamentally the way we work and how we design how we manage the manufacturing process, and of course, how we operate our equipment. And one of the things that really is kind of bothering people these days when we talk about the issue of AI is really, will AI replace the human in the way in which we design and build and manage airplanes? And I'm glad to report that that will not take place. The human being will always have a place, a very important place, in how we, in fact, look at aerospace manufacturing. So I'm going to just give you a few highlights in terms of what it is that we see in the research side in terms of understanding the evolution of AI and how AI is going to be, yes, transforming the business, but not necessarily replacing. It will be a complementary process to both design and engineering, and we'll talk a bit about that in a minute. But what we're trying to look at in terms of aviation and aerospace is really create smart airplanes looking at smart design, looking at smart components, components that really will in fact provide you with information about the state of that component and where it is that that component might need some assistance, might need some replacement, and be able to predict when that component will in fact need replacement and need adjustment. So that is the intention of, the, of, of what transformation in the business of aerospace manufacturing is all about, trying to create something different that is really self-reporting and the, any issues you have in it. But the one underlying element about AI is data. And we talked about it this morning in terms of the number of issues associated with data gathering and understanding how data works. AI doesn't work without data. We need data. We need lots of data. We need lots of historical data. We need data about real time experiences that our components and our aircraft and our people are going through. So if, if you have data, you have the, the, the foothold to move, to move forward in AI. Without data and good data and quality data, uh, AI does have some issues to deal with. But just to give you some ideas in terms of what's been going on today and how it's going to leverage itself into the future, uh, one of the things that's really evolving is something called neural manufacturing supply networks. And neural manufacturing reminds me of the days when I had to go back to the Santa Fe Institute down in New Mexico and understand thinking about neural bots and neural networks. But it really is a way in which we can, in fact, look at changing the way we think about managing manufacturing. manufacturing. No, what, what? No. Much better. Thank you. Um, so when you talk about designing, in designing everything, we talk about generative design. And generative design is a way in which we can, in fact, change the way we do business and using AI as an integral part of the design process. If you use AI, AI does not have a preconceived notion of what a good aircraft design should look like. It doesn't have a preconceived notion of what an engine should look like. Because it says what we want to do is optimize and get the best design possible. So the airplanes of the future, the engines of the future may not look anything like what you have today because AI is involved in really looking at a lot of complexity that is beyond the human mind and really applying new technologies, new practices, new processes, and new design parameters to build and design new airplanes and new power plants. So 
It will not necessarily follow the same pattern as we've had because we've all been engineers. We've all gone through engineering school. We have a notion of what historically these things should look like. AI will change that. Uh, one of the other issues that we have in terms of how we, in fact, look at AI is really robots. And we're all saying, well, let's bring some more robots into this process and look at trying to standardize and get quality into the work that we're doing. And we'll get it by robots because robots do everything the same way every time. Mm -hmm. And the, the one issue that we've had, and I had a conversation with Mr. Murray this morning, he says we need volume. We need a lot more airplanes to be built in order to make the economics of robotics work. And the notion would be that we don't necessarily need robots to do what they've done in the past, which is what I call scripted robots. They stay in one location, they drill holes, they, they do laser welding, they do cleaning. We don't need those anymore. We've got lots of those around that are stationary. We need adaptive robots. And by adaptive robots, meaning robots that can roam the machine floor, that can do different components, that can do different tasks on different airplanes. And they are adaptive and they sense the environment that they're in. So that's where we're going in the world of robotics and to how to change the way in which we look at a manufacturing plant. Um, we need basically people to make this thing work. Yes, I'm very happy to say that McGill, that we are in fact looking at bringing out of our university graduates individuals that will in fact be the right individuals that understand AI, that understand robotics, that understand data analytics, that can in fact be, the, be the, the next generation of engineers and technicians and data analysts and data science people that the industry needs. But we're not there yet. Uh, we're still starting to figure out what is it that we need. We're slowly developing our programs to make it operational. So count on us to be able to do things differently. Um, before I conclude, I just want to talk about a couple of initiatives that are out there that really kind of uh, strike my fancy when it talks about the way in which AI can transform the business. So we've all heard about digital twins. And digital twins are interesting in as much as what they try to do is take a physical process, a physical asset, and replicate it in the digital world so that we as designers, as operators, are able to really understand, you know, how would this thing work with different stimulus that we apply to this digital twin or this physical asset. So we don't have to actually have a situation that's physically represented, we do it digitally. And that is really the next generation of tools that are going to be coming out, and we're going to be using it quite a bit in our university programs to really kind of emulate and hopefully simulate cheaply, effectively, and get the design process and the release process down to a way in which we can, in fact, deliver technology much quicker than we can in the past. So we're using it to design quick design quicker, build quicker, and build it more efficiently. So we're moving away from a design, build, test environment, which is what we've always had in the past. We're going to go model, we're going to analyze, and we're going to build. And that's the paradigm shift that we're working on in terms of trying to make sure that we've delivered people who can understand that model and are able to deliver to that. Um, the one thing about the industry, it is still certificated. We still require regulatory approval to everything that we do. Mm. And that's a good thing. We need that. We need that oversight. We need to have the ability to make sure that we deliver safe air transportation. And we have a ways to go to get the regulators to understand AI and how AI works and the degree to which we are using AI in our manufacturing process. So to me, that's the biggest challenge that we have, is really trying to figure out how do we, in fact, look at getting the regulatory bodies to come along with us and understand the value of a digital twin, understand the value of a neural manufacturing network, and to make sure that they, in fact, come along with us as designers and builders, come along with us for the ride, and that they're able to certify the activities. Today, there's a lot of misconceptions about AI. The regulatory bodies still don't trust it, with good reason we really haven't taken them along for the ride. So that's our biggest challenge, and hopefully we'll be able to, to get where we want to be in the short term. Um, that's about it for the future. In terms of my last parting Thank thought you. about where we've been. Uh, so I'm a Trekkie from way back, um, <laughs> and I really try to understand where we are going to go with how we work. The fully autonomous assembly line is, a, is coming. May not be in my lifetime. Hopefully it'll be in some of yours. 
but it is something that we basically will have to, in fact, understand. We will, in fact, be designing very strange airplanes and very strange engines in the future. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, John. And thank you. So maybe just last word, uh, I just want to tell you that Aerospace is waiting for all your bright brains to join uh, our very uh, um, dynamic industry. So don't hesitate. Don't think that the barrier to entry is too high to, to join the Aerospace. And please uh, talk to us uh, during uh, these next two days. Thank you very much for the, uh, uh, yep. the, your presence, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, have a nice uh, forum for Thank the you, next merci. two days. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, panel. Thank you very much, and thanks, Melanie. Well done.